I was the lucky recipient, and you have to be watching this on YouTube if you want to see it. It's a book, and for the folks who've listened to the show, know I love books. And so when Todd Kolb sent me the bad lie, why traditional golf instruction is failing you, I was like, yes. We have him on the show. It's Todd Kolb. How are you, man? Welcome to our program. Mark, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here, and and I appreciate the opportunity to, you know, share some ideas, maybe get people thinking a little bit about how they uh, can play better golf. What I've read of this so far, it hit me in my soul, and it truly did, and I'll tell you why in a minute. But before we go there, I want you to introduce yourself to our global audience. Obviously, you're a well-known golf instructor here in the States, but we have folks around the world, so tell us a little bit about you. Yeah, I mean, like like yourself and probably a lot of the listeners here, um, I was introduced to the game as a kid. Uh, mm -hmm. My dad's a fireman by trade. My mom's a school really? teacher, just a regular, you know, regular Midwestern family, born and raised in South Dakota. Uh, both my sisters are golfers as well. Um, but just started playing golf. Uh, and I met a gentleman by the name of Dave Hanton uh, when I caddied at the country club. I was 13 years old. And it's interesting, uh, Mark, as you go through life, you look back. I'm 53 now. You kind of reflect on some of the things that happened in your life. Mm -hmm. You know, when you're a kid, you don't think much about it when you're 13, you know, because you're 13. But anyhow, the short of the story is I met a gentleman by the name of Dave Hanton. And um, he was a banker. I played golf at ASU. Was in the, is in the South Dakota Hall of Fame. Uh, golf. And uh, he started a golf course uh, called Willow Run Golf Course. And yeah. so I, I caddied for him. I went out there. I picked the range. I, I, you know, worked in the shop, all the stuff that we all do. And when I graduated from New Mexico State in uh, 1993, I wanted to coach. I wanted to start doing some teaching. And he said, go for it. There's a the driving range. There's some balls. Go make it happen. And, and I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. So off I went. Uh, 28 years later, here I am. I've been a member of the PGA. I've been very blessed. Uh, great support from my my wife and my two children. And just trying to help people play better golf. At the end of the day, I think most of us um, just love the game and we want to share that passion with others. So um, it's been a great journey. Amen. Um, now, me and how your book hit me. Um, when I was I'm 52, so I'm a youngish golf instructor like you, but when I was younger, <laughs> and for the folks listening down the road, this was in 2023, so we might be older and grayer. <laughs> um, the, to me, I felt like there was, I had a burden inside, and the burden was that, uh, to me, golf instruction works in fads and trends, just like the golf swing does, you know, and thoughts and stuff, and, and obviously, oftentimes, whoever has the loudest voice gets the most information out. And I felt like Martin Luther back in the day where I had my beliefs on the game and I had my theses and I didn't have a church door to stamp them onto and say, look, this is the Protestant movement starting. And so I, I was like, I, I wrote an ebook way back in the day called Scandalously Simple, the hmm. real way to hit better or the easy way to hit better golf shots. And I read yours and the way you started it by listing a few things to say, hey, uh, this stuff is getting misunderstood. And this, you're trying to do this stuff. You need to get all of the information about this because context is so very important. And I feel like you bring so much context with this book that you heard, you've heard me before we went live. Yeah. I'm big on understanding. Like the information is one thing. The, the internet is rampant with information, but knowing what's applicable to you is the key. And you've got the stuff here in a easy to read paperback book. So that's why it was so meaningful to me. So now that was enough of me. Your inspiration for writing this, I'm guessing, was kind of the same thing, right? Yeah, man, you said it perfectly. Um, you know, and I don't consider myself old. Um, we like to call our golfers experienced golfers. Yeah. We don't call them old golfers. Um, is one of the phrases that we experienced we've and less mobile. <laughs> this is true. Yeah. This is true. But you know, I, I mean, all of us, as as life goes on, you have different experiences. And and you know, when I was 24, 25, first started teaching, I I, I just taught whatever was the newest and latest things. And, and that's the beauty of, of, of time is that you see things come and you see things go. Um, and it's not that those things are bad things. And it's one of the things I want to be very clear about, you know, when I, I kind of make the claim in, you know, why traditional golf coaching or instruction is hurting you. It's, it's certainly not coming from a position that the information that is generally out there is bad information. There are wonderful golf instructors all over this globe that can help people play better golf. But the real premise behind the book is, is that 
just open your eyes when you see stuff that comes in front of you. Is it just a trend or are we looking at that because that particular golfer happened to play really well that week? Mm -hmm. And I think that we're just the nature in which the world that we live in, everybody, everything is so trendy. It's immediate, it's instant gratification. And I think when you strip that back and you know this, you're a great player yourself, your family's been involved in golf and wonderful players and you follow it and, and coach it on a regular basis. The core fundamentals that make people great are just, some of them are consistent. And I think what I wanted to do is put something out there that just challenged the status quo and, and had people say, Hey, wait a minute, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm Walt and I'm 63 and I love golf just as much as John Rahm does, but I'm not going to move like John. I'm not going to swing like John. I'm not going to practice as much as I can, but I still love the game as much as he does. But should I really be following his swing advice or should I be following the advice of something that works for me? Well, a lot of folks, just to build on your uh, anecdote there, a lot of folks aren't aware that John Rahm as a young man had a club foot. And, and that's oh. the reason why he moves like he does. Oh, I did not. Oh, I, I learned something. I did not know that either. Testament to how he thinks about the game, which is similar to what oh. you're saying there. Every golf instructor he's had, and there haven't been many, he said to them, this is how I move. This is how I swing. Help me to hit the ball better doing this, not go changing my golf swing. And and that's right in line with what you're saying. Yeah, you know, I, um, I, I've i always felt that good instruction is more about guiding than dictating. Mm -hmm. I, I think good instructors guide. Um, they don't, I mean, they tell people what to do, but but ultimately it's, it's good golf is about finding your own way and your own journey. And a good coach helps guide that direction and brings things forward or pulls things away or whatever. But ultimately you've got to find what works best, best for you. And what I did in, you know, what I tried to do at least in the bad lie was, was bring forward some general concepts that are really geared more towards, we call them the experience golfer, the older golfer that I think we see in, in golf swings that last um, generations and decades. I think a lot of those same fundamentals are in there. Yeah. There's nothing new under the sun. That's for certain. Um, and there are fads and trends that go along. There's one more thing I just want to touch before we get into a few items from the book. Um, I've given countless lessons as you have. And oftentimes on the lesson T, when you have a learner who's been to somebody else, and I will say to them, I'm like, look here, if I've given you the right advice, the golf ball is going to go better instantaneously. Now, it might be difficult to do because it's new, but if you're doing something differently and the ball's not going better, you're not doing the right thing. And, and and this is what you're sort of saying in the book here too, as you go through elements to say, hey, um, you're going to do what's going to make the golf ball go better, not necessarily what the trend of the day is. Yes? A hundred percent. We've all been guilty of it. I've been guilty of it. Um, and we, we teach certain systems or or things that are hot at that particular moment. But but ultimately, the ball tells you, I mean, that, that's the beauty of golf. And that's the reason we love it. That's the reason we hate it because it ultimately tells us. And I, I've always, I've always believed, and I've shared this with a lot of my students that, you know, the game is always speaking to us in some form or fashion when we have to be open to listening to it. And, and if you're trying to do something and you're putting in the effort and you're genuinely engaged in that, and you're not getting the results, the game is telling you like, Hey, maybe this isn't the path for you. And I think that that so many times, and that was really the whole premise why I wrote the book is, is just to help regular golfers, just open up your eyes. Don't be so blinded by just because it's from Todd or because it's from Mark or mm. because it's from this particular magazine or, or news channel that it's gospel. It might be gospel for that individual that they're referencing, but ultimately you got to find what works best for you. Amen. So to that, uh, we can't go over everything that's in the book. We'll share where folks can get it soon. Uh, I have my copy here, autographed inside. I'm very excited. Um, I, there, you, you kind of started, there's two capstones to the book. You started with three observations and you kind of ended with three observations. So I want to touch them all. Okay. And I'm going to pitch them to you and just let you elaborate a little bit. And at the start, you said three things to think about differently. And the first one of those is the X factor. And now for the new listener to this way back in the day, and it was by Jim McLean and Jim is a friend. Um, he's been on the show. Um, he wrote a cover article for Golf Digest and it was called the X factor. And the X factor was where it's a differential between how far your shoulders turn and how far your hips turn. And all the power golfers made that X wider. 
I look, it was very appropriate, but a lot of golfers to me misunderstood it and misapplied it. So I'd, I'd love you to elaborate a little bit. Yeah, really good point. And, and uh, a lot of us would not have jobs if it wasn't for somebody like Jim, who was kind of one of the, one of the frontiers who kind Mount of rushed me. And, might be on yeah, the really is. Of American golf. <laughs> There's about four or five of them, and and I and and we're lucky that we have them because they they forge the way for the rest of us. Um, but yeah, I, I think that you know one of the things that I see a lot when people come to the lesson tee is especially for our experienced golfers or older golfers, they lack mobility, strength, some things like that, or they got ailments. And and anytime you're restricting something, but yet trying to move something, I just don't think that it's a good situation. I'll, let me be very clear. I'm not a I'm not a physician, I'm not a physical therapist. You know, but I just see people who are trying to restrict certain things and move certain other things. Um, and I think movement is good. It's good for rhythm. It's good for timing. And when you look at swings that have lasted a long time, I think they have more hip turn. I think the trail leg releases some. Yeah. I think that allows them to turn their shoulders more. Um, and so uh, that's one of the reasons why, I mean, we we teach with, you know, track mans and force plates and all that stuff. We have all that things. But but the, the thing I always be am careful with as the longer I teach is that with what we call science or what we call facts, um, we also call the other things science and facts in, in the 70s and 80s that now we are know are not true. Yeah. And so how do we know that we're not living in the age of what we consider a fact scientifically that in 10 years might say, you know what, that wasn't actually true. So uh, the X factor, I think is, you know, in general is good. But like you said, Mark, I think for a lot of golfers, more turn is better than trying to restrict. Yeah, and just to quick put a bow on that quickly, um, you know, I was called out <laughs> way back in the day by a good friend and a very good golf instructor in Terry Rolls, and we were talking about a client, and and I said to him, well, if you do this with a lower body, that might line things up, and he goes, yeah, I agree, but but I don't see why we should try and limit movements because the golf swing is a movement. And he goes, if you start cutting, you know, taking away dynamics from the lower body, you know, then the upper body's who's 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 to say that they could do this stuff and so your your point is so very well founded with that you know freedom of movement as long as as long as it's in a stable area is good um the second point to think about differently is i love this is the flat backswing and if you're watching on mm. youtube you can see me with the inverted commas um <laughs> flat backswing and deep hands. Now, if I had a dollar for every person on social media right now that's talking about hand depth and laying the shaft down, I'd probably be chilling out on a beach with a margarita. <laughs> so, so why don't you bring some truth to this stuff, please? Yeah, well, this this is one that that um, I don't know if I call it controversial or might you know get me in trouble with some of my fellow golf instructors. And you know, like I said, there's a lot of there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, I just, I, I feel like from, from my own experience, when, when people try to get their hands too low or all this like, concept about shallowing the golf club and all these types of things, I mean, I, I just, I don't know. I think it's overdone. Um, I do know this, that um, the flatter the backswing, um, the lower the hands are going to be at the top of the backswing. Yeah. And I believe that a lead arm that works more straight back and up, we call it the vertical line swing, or a lead arm that works, no, it's not straight back and up. I mean, you know, it's not, a Ferris wheel, but in general, we get the idea more straight back and up. Um, I think it's easier to repeat. I think it allows uh, people who, who are struggling with flexibility and mobility, it allows them to get some length to their swing. Quite honestly, in my opinion, um, I think getting the hands a little bit higher in the backswing allows them to drop the club easier to the inside versus being flat and then trying to really, really rotate. Yeah. Um, and I also think that it can help create some, some more club head speed. So one of the co core concepts of, of, uh, the vertical line swing and in, in the bad book is a lead arm that works more straight back and up. And last but not least, you know, Jack Nicholas, Tom Watson, uh, Johnny Miller, Andy North. I mean, you know, we're talking about generational golfers who played for years and years. They had pretty similar looks. Now I know there's other people who've had flatter backswings and around, um, but, but I like to see it a little bit more straight back and up. Yeah. Uh, well, modern day golf is uh, Justin Thomas springs to mind. And if you ask anyone who's watching this, uh, you say to them, name great ball strikers in the game and JT will be on everyone's lips. Yeah. yeah, I, yeah. I like the arms to, you know, as the body rotates, the arms swing up, you know, if, if you get too deep, it's really hard to get that thing back to the golf ball. And the voice of experience is talking to this because as a young, yeah. I didn't have a teacher, but I got the modern fundamentals by Ben Hogan. And I weakened my lead grip, just like Hogan showed. And I swung deeper and I rotated more. 
And where do you think my bad shot started to go toward? <laughs> right field, right field. Uh, right yes. Field. Yeah. You know, that's a, you bring up a good point there. You, you, you um, because it's one of the things. You know, I, I um, we talked earlier about. Uh, I think good instruction is about guiding it and really simplifying the game. We're living in this time where um, the loudest voices are very technical and very. And, and I'm not saying science is wrong. I, I'm not saying that at all. But but like for the average person who's watching golf. They 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 want the game simpler and they want the game easier. Now, if we want to have a conversation amongst golf instructors on the side and we want to debate it a hundred percent, but when it comes to you know to Claire who walks on your lesson tee or Walt who walks on your lesson tee, it's like when I go to the doctor, I just want him to say, "Hey, man, do this," and and I I don't need to know all the background on it. Yeah. Um, and so we really simplify the golf swing, and just like you said, Mark, it's the arms take the the arms take the club back and up, and the body takes it around. Yeah. That's it in a nutshell. So. Desktop, the screensaver on my laptop is a mm. picture of Albert Einstein with a quote going, uh, those who can't understand, can't explain a concept simply don't really understand it enough. <laughs> Amen that, to that. That's what keeps me on track. Um, the final thing to think about differently, and again, this is what I say, it's tickling my my sensibilities, is the, the big thing, distance versus control. Because like right, everything's about power nowadays. I, I get into countless arguments with golfers. I didn't even, I didn't argue with him, but Mark Brody, the inventor of strokes gained was on the show and they're all talking about drive it farther and you will shoot lower. And I'm like, yeah, no doubt. But on the other side of the coin, I see golfers trying to drive it farther and they're spray gunning balls all over the place and they couldn't play it dead in the Western movie. So please talk about distance versus control. Well, thank you, Brad. This this one I'm probably the most passionate about um, because I think it's the loudest voice right now in golf. It's distance, distance, distance. And he, here, here's how I summarize it. I watch a lot of junior golf. I watch a lot of college golf. A lot of watch a lot of amateur golf. I don't see people making bogeys because they can't get to par fours and two. I just don't see it. Mm -hmm. I don't see people making bogeys because they can't reach par threes and one or par fives and through. I see them making bogeys because they're in the trees. They're out of bounds. They're in the water. They're all over the map. And so um, now if you hit it long and straight, is that better than short and straight? Of course it is. Nobody's going to debate that. But but the thing is, is that and this this just goes back to the heart of, of part of why I wrote the book is this information that that continues to get pushed to the 99.9% .9 of the people who play the game for recreation is based on the tour pro. Mm -hmm. It's based on tour pro information. Yes, if if we take um Bubba Watson and put him in the trees, he can hook it. it, it what, we can do whatever he wants with the golf ball. If I put Walt in the deep rough and in the trees, he's got to pitch it sideways. Yes. And and so what what I believe anyhow, and, and, and maybe I'm missing something, but what I see is, is that when we talk about just getting closer to the hole is always better, we assume that everybody's skill set is completely equal in terms of creating shots around the green or hooking, or, and that's just not the case at all mm -hmm. in the golf that I watch. So um, I kind of, it's one of the core concepts of my, that my dad taught me and I teach all my students, you got to be able to control the golf ball. You got to be able to control the ball. Now, can you control the ball and hit it longer? Is that an advantage? Of course it is. But I would, I would rather, I don't see people losing golf tournaments because they can't get to par fours and two, or they can't get to par, you know, uh, fives and three. You remind me of a quote I heard on this very show, and I need to not, not note this down before I forget it again. Um, it was by Justin Parsons, and he said very candidly, he goes, you know, Mark, some human beings just have a VW engine, and some of them have a Ferrari engine. He goes, and me as an instructor, uh, me trying to take a VW and turn it into a Ferrari, that's not happening. You just got to get that thing to, one, understand how fast it can go, and make yes. sure it understands what it has to do to there. I'm trying to make it do something that it isn't. I mean, that that's that's fool's gold, that sort of stuff. Yeah, one hundred percent, and and I and I even you know, and like I said, I I think that, um, and I know you spend a lot of your your time and your life out on you know the tour with the best players in the world, and I and I think that you know, if if somebody wants to play golf with their name on their bag and make a living, okay, we can we can have a conversation about distance because they're trying to do something that in the, at an elite level, mm -hmm. but the vast majority of you know, junior golfers, high school golfers, even college golfers to a certain degree, men and women who are playing the game from a recreation standpoint, 
they got to control their golf ball better. And if they can do that, they're going to, they're going to shoot lower scores. They're not going to shoot lower scores by adding 15 yards to their drive. And the truth of it is PGA professional, you got guys got many arrows in your quiver to make them hit it farther. And the first thing is getting the right clubs in your hand. I mean, you don't have to start changing your golf swing, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Getting them fit with the right clubs, getting them, you know, getting them just to understand how to play the game is yeah. so important. Right. Uh, we'll move along before you and I get a little hot and bothered. <laughs> <laughs> then you go through the book and it's, it's an easy read. And there's a bunch of chapters talking about, you know, areas in the swing, grip, impact, transition. You kind of break the swing down a little bit. And then towards the end, there's some really interesting, fun uh, chapters and such. But the one I've picked that I want to touch on, um, that again, to put a sort of a, a bow on this conversation, is you said three skills that will transform your game. And I saw the headline and I'm like, I'm keen to see this. And with all three of them, you hit me between my eyes. Two of them, especially, I was like, yes and yes. <laughs> okay. You th the one that you said was the most important, we'll leave that to the last one. And the first one you said said was lag putting. Now, I'm a stickler because mm -hmm. Bob Jones is my hero. Gary, mm -hmm. my mentor, but Bob Jones, and he said many things, very quotable, Mr. Jones. And he said, the key to golf is to turn three strokes into two. And that doesn't mean you drive it farther. That means around the greens, you don't take a chip and three putts. We don't, you know, double chip and three putt, or you don't chip and three putt. And so you said lag putting is a skill. And let me tell you, from work on the tour, those guys are tremendous yes. lag putters. And they never, no one ever talks about it. Everyone talks about the speed. So, so talk about lag putting, please. Yeah, amen to that. You, you, you hit the nail on the head there. You go, you go watch a tour event, uh, the men or the women. Um, that they, they are incredible lag putters. Um, once again, I not to keep beating the theme to death, but it goes back to kind of the premise of, of why I want to put the book together. Like what is the best interest for the average golfer, the experienced golfer? And, you know, um, the average golfer, they, they hit a good drive. They hit a good second shot at, let's say, on a par four, and they get the ball in the green. Um, very seldom, if the ball's in the green, are they hitting it to like 8, 10, 10 feet, 12 feet, 15 feet, like a, like we see on TV, right? Like a tour pro. They hit two good shots. They got 30 feet. They yep. got 40 feet, Right. And they've hit these two wonderful shots. Well, if they can't lag that up there and, and make an easy par move to the next hole, they, they have completely lost all of the benefit of hitting the first two good shots. And this is eye-opening when when you watch when you watch high school golf. I mean, I, I think high school golf in essence is one of the best things to watch because in essence, it's it's kind of a precursor to what you see in even in just regular golf. Um a, a, a one person dribbles it down the fairway off the tee. They kind of skull it up around the green and they chip it on to 20 feet and two putt make a bogey. The next kid hits a bomb down the middle of the fairway. It's a great second shot, you know, to 30 feet and three putts it. And they walk to the next second hole and they both made the same score. And you're thinking, what is going on? This person is playing better golf, but they're not capitalizing on it. Now, I believe that the players who then take the next step to the college level, then they, they, they start cleaning that up. They get a little bit better at it. And then those who are in the college level move to the pros, like you just said perfectly, Mark, they have that dial down. Yeah. And, and to me, leg putting is, is so important to lower your scores for the regular golfer. To make that personal, anyone who follows me on social media, you'll see a video of my daughter's golf swing who can smash it off the tee. She hits it like she <laughs> fell out of heaven, but she will shoot 83, four, five at the blink of an eye because she's taking three four around the green all of the time my brother trevor he's a good golfer <laughs> <laughs> i'd say so <laughs> Masters among others. his eldest son jacob same thing and trevor the one evening i'll never forget uh, we might have had a glass or two of wine and he was like man this makes me crazy when i watch him play <laughs> golf because he hit the ball on the green too and he walked out there with five it's such an important skill so what i do want to say is look the folks got to get the book but share a quick drill that folks can do. If you, if they had a lesson with you, what would you say? I could go and do this to improve your lag putting. Yeah, I think, well, well, first of all, thank you for sharing that story because it's, it's good to know that, that, that this Kolb is not the only golf instructor who's, who at times is frustrated <laughs> watching yeah. their own children uh -huh. uh, golf. It's good to know that great minds like you and your brother are, have the same challenges. It makes me feel better. So thank you. Um, you know, I, I think well, I'll give you a couple thoughts. One would be, um, I mean, you know, the simple ladder drill that's been around for decades. You know, you drop a ball every three feet, maybe start at 15 feet, 18 feet, 21, 24, something like that is, you know, is, is a simple drill that anybody can do. I will say this from an application standpoint, one of my favorite things to do is when people are making their practice motions, 
uh, that they're kind of doing them beside the golf ball, but they're looking at the hole as okay. they're making their practice motions. I think the eyes and visualizing and where the ball is going to roll are huge when it comes to feel and touch. So that'd be one little drill. And then one little tip that they could do, you know, tomorrow at the golf course, just look at the hole when you're making your practice motions and you'd be surprised at how your touch and feel improves. Yeah. Love it. All right. The second one of the three skills to transform your game is chipping. And last year, last season, um, I, became the volunteer assistant coach for a ladies high school golf team good for you my daughter's on said team and uh so i looked at them at the beginning of the season i'm like i'm we're gonna get into shot saving mode uh you're gonna spend less time on the range we're gonna get really good from five feet and in mm -hmm. and from off the green i want you to guarantee me if you're inside of 30 yards of the target that you can get the ball onto the green because if you do that two putt, you're probably going to make a whole bunch of fives and 18 fives add up to 90 and you clip some of that stuff and all of a sudden you're in the low 80s, high 70s. I'm preaching to your choir, okay? Um, so, so, But I want to talk to you about the chipping because I feel like chipping is an underrated skill and I feel like nowadays chipping, the art of it is lost because of the lofted wedge that's become um, a thing. Yeah, it's a, it's a great point. Number one is your your daughter seems is lucky to have you because um, I would do the same thing if if, if I, we would be chipping nonstop. Well, they're chipping. looking for a coach for next year. So <laughs> okay. <laughs> I think oh, I got fired. <laughs> That's fantastic. Um, the chipping is my favorite thing to teach because, like you like you just said, Mark, I, I um, we've gotten so caught up in this distance, 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 right? Um, but chipping separates. Chipping separates. And, you know, like you said, the tour pros, when they're out there, you watch them. They, it is amazing at how good they are at chipping. Um, you know, so here, here's a scenario. Uh, you know, two people miss the green. One person chips it to three, four feet. Another person chips it to 10 feet. The make percentages from three to four feet relative to eight or 10 feet are just drastically different. And over the course of a round, especially for, you know, a, a player who's trying to become a single digit hand, handicap. It's just, it, that's where the separation comes. You're, you're not, you're either good at chipping or you're just not good. There is no really in between. And um, even the best players in the world and especially regular golfers, they're doing a lot of chipping. They're chipping probably, gosh, 10, 12 times around, maybe even more because they're, you know, consider some par five. So it's a skill that's not talked about a lot for some odd reason. They don't even show it a lot on TV. Very seldom do they show chip shots on TV unless, unless they in. Yeah. pull it out. Yeah. yeah. You know, and I mean, I just, once again, it's the premise of like, Hey, let's, let's just take a step back and think about what is important for this particular group, not a tour pro, but a particular group to play better golf. I think more focus on chipping would help them. I'm going to tee you up here with an observation of mine. Um, I said often, and the folks who've listened to the show will hear this ad nauseum for the new folks. Welcome. Um, <laughs> Todd's fans coming to join us. <laughs> <laughs> I say to the folks, if you're going to drive it better, you'll make fewer big numbers. So get good yes. at shot number one, you'll make fewer big numbers. I'm like, get good at shot number three, and you're going to make a whole lot of small numbers. If you're good at shot number mm. three, you can make lots of threes and fours. If you're good at shot number one, you'll make fewer sixes and sevens and stuff like that. So I'm oh, gonna I'm gonna tee you up to say, okay, here's a drill, go and work on your chipping because that shot number three is crucial to scoring. Yeah, I'm gonna steal that from you. I like that. Okay. I, I agree. I agree a hundred percent with that. Um, you know, you look at people who have good long careers or just play good solid golf in general. They're they're usually good drivers of the golf ball. I mean, you know, they might not be the longest, but it goes back to our earlier conversation. They control the ball. The ball is in play on a regular basis. Um, when it comes to chipping, um, I do two two things that I like to do. One is um, I have people hit a lot of chip shots, uh, basically balancing on just their lead foot, trying to create some stability so they're not moving. Uh, too much. I think that's good for uh, controlling low point and where the club hits the ground. It's Todd, very simple. Todd, but Todd, but Todd, but Todd. Oh my goodness! I'm supposed to rotate through the ball. What am I going to do? Of it? <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, it is. I, I know it. It is, and and I think that that you know, once again, it goes back to like you were saying earlier, Mark, like just keeping the game simple. Like we don't need to overcomplicate this game. So just, Hey, hit bounce on your lead foot, hit some shots, control the low point, simple and easy. The second drill that I would have them do uh, that I do with all my players is, you know, on decent lies, not, a, not necessarily out of the rough, but I'll just have them hit some chip shots with their dominant hand just for some touch and feel. So if you're a right-handed golfer, we just hit some right-handed chips only. I think that's good for touch and feel and coordination. So if we can control low point, 
if we can improve our coordination, our touch and feel, you know, you're usually, you see some progress in your chipping. I'm scribbling notes fever feverishly. You can use mine. I'm going to use all of yours. <laughs> um, okay. The final one is strategic aiming. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I giggled when I saw this because I've had a few caddies on the show before. And those caddies, they, their salary is largely determined by how well their player plays. And more often than not, when I'm not talking is when I do my best job. And you hear the caddy player interaction. The final marching orders will be something like, all right, see your shot, keep it smooth at the television tower. You hear them say at the TV tower more than anything else. And that TV tower normally sits right over the back middle portion of the green and the flags cut left and right. That's my take on strategic aiming. What say you? Yeah, well, you're, you're spot on. I um, Once again, um, you know, we live in this world of, uh, you know, you flip, you know, sports center or whatever it is, golf channel, you know, you see highlights guy making a bomb pot, you know, super long drive, hitting it to five feet, you know, from 200 yards out. But the truth of the matter is, is that, that the majority of, of the tournament, the game or whatever is, is one with the fundamental stuff, get the ball in the middle of the green, give yourself big margins for air. And these are not new concepts, but, but they're concepts that need for, for like people like yourself and me, we need to keep bringing these forward because the regular golfer is getting bombarded with highlights and, yeah. and highlight reels. And that's not real golf. Real golf is Thursday morning, 8, 10 tee time. It's the third hole. You made a really around. good up and down <laughs> yeah. to save a par that kept your tournament going. Right. I mean, and, but we don't see that. And, and so I think at times we're misleading the general golfing public in terms of what it takes to actually play better golf. And something as simple as just picking a, a conservative target can go a long ways. There to me is a bit of a shadow to that because what you say, people are like, yeah, Todd, I get you. And it's like, wow, you shone a light on my situation, but with every light, there's a shadow. Right? And the shadow to me of this is the discipline it takes to aim away from the targets with an eight iron in your hand. So please uh, uh, help us out there. Yeah, it's a, it's, that's a good, it's a good point because, um, you know, you think about even when we practice, I, I never really thought about this till a couple of years ago. Um, you know, when I would have students, we'd be hitting golf balls we, and we're always constantly hitting out a flag. Like, Hey, hit at this flag, hit at this flag, hit at this red flag, blue flag, whatever. And then we tell them to go to the golf course and they're on the first one and say, Hey, don't aim at the flag aim for the <laughs> TV <point>. tower. Right. <laughs> and you're like, well, yeah. wait a minute. I just spent, you know, a hundred golf balls hitting that different flags. And now you're telling me not to hit at a flag. So I think even from a coaching standpoint, we can look at that and, and start giving people different, Hey, hit at this, you know, hit at the slope, hit at the side of the green or whatever. But not always making the, your your target on the driving range a flag, for lack of a better word. Um, and then when it comes, you know, just out on the golf course, I, I think um, patience is is just in, you, you see it in growth of, of younger golfers and they go from high school to college and stuff. You see patience develop. You're talking about, you know, mm -hmm. your kids playing golf and, and your brother's son playing golf. And, you know, it just, you know, you drives, drives us as parents crazy because you don't see the patience. And what they don't understand, once again, because they're, they're bombarded with highlight reels. They think they got to make seven birdies to have a good round of golf. Yeah. And they just don't. What you got to do is you got to string some parts together. You got to get into the round. You got to get going. And then before you know it, like, you know, I chipped one in or I made a long putt and I had a great day. So patience is, is key. Along those lines, you know, I, I get to work in some cool spots and, you know, CBS on the weekends is one, but I do work for PGA Tour Live on ESPN mm -hmm. Plus as well where you get to see the professional golfers and they're always the featured group. So it's the stars of yeah. you know, the field play on Thursdays and Fridays. And you're right, because they hit some random looking shots, but there, there'll be a time where they're just kind of like surviving and then they'll hit a few good ones and thrive and yeah. sort of this in and out the whole way along there. And then at the end, you're like, my goodness, he put together 69, but it wasn't that pretty looking. Yeah, it's a really great point. I mean, I, I, it takes a while to understand that most of our best rounds aren't highlight reels from the first hole to the 18th hole. They're, they're kind of start out kind of, and sometimes they start out hot. Don't get me wrong. I mean, but I'm just saying a lot of them are like, yeah, I was playing so, so, you know, I shot one under at the turn and, you know, oh, geez, I happened to hit a par five and two and made a long putt and geez, I made that par save on that one hole. And before you know, you're like, you know, it's kind of, I don't say a boring 69 or 68 or, or maybe a 79 for, you know, an amateur golfer, whatever their goal is. But, but 
it, golf is a marathon. It's not a sprint and, and learning to, to navigate that and, and get through holes and get into the round. I mean, it's, it's like a, it's like, a, I keep, hate to use an example of high school golfers, but I mean, you know, if, if a high school golfer is two over through three, they're like, oh man, it's not a good day. But if they string together a couple of pars, another two over through eight, they're like, yeah, you know, this yeah, isn't too bad. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So patience is, is, is important. Very important. Folks, the book is The Bad Lie, Why Traditional Golf Instruction is Failing You and What to Do Instead. Todd, please share with folks where they can go and get this. Yeah, well, it's available on Amazon. You can just go to Amazon and look it up right there and, and uh, you can purchase it there. You can go to badliegolfbook.com, right. badliegolfbook.com. You can order it right there. There's a link right directly to the Amazon. But Amazon is the best place to get it. Um, and it's, it's been, uh, it's a labor of love. It was more work than I anticipated. I do need to give a shout out to Abby. Uh, Abby was, uh, the gal who kind of helped put it together. She's the one who helps take my thoughts and put them on paper and made me look smart, uh, or, or read smart, I should say. So it was a lot of fun. Well, you talk smart too. Um, I'm sure folks going to want to follow you. Do you do social media? Yeah. So best place to follow us is on U at us golf TV. So we got a website, usgolftv.com. Our YouTube channel is very popular. Same thing. Us golf TV. Those are the best couple of places to, uh, to find us. And at the end of the day, just like yourself, I appreciate you bringing this forward and giving us as golf instructors and people in the game of golf market, this opportunity to just share some thoughts. I just want to help people play better golf. And I, we just want them to go into information that's brought in front of them in this day and age when we live, when there's just constant bombarding of information. There's a lot of good information out there, but just make sure and understand, is this information the best information for me and my stage of life or physical abilities or the time that I have for golf? And, and just maybe going with a little bit of a filter and you might see some better results. Yeah, folks, knowledge is one thing, but wisdom is entirely another. That's a wise guy who joined us. Uh, Todd, appreciate your time. I appreciate the book. I've loved reading it so far. Um, folks need to get this. It'll really help them. Thanks for joining us. I really appreciate you. Thank you, Mark. Appreciate the opportunity. 